paper. So I uh, introduced the full Schrodinger's equation yesterday, and it reads uh, h bar. Uh, by the way, you can write the right-hand side in the following form, minus h bar squared over 2m partial squared partial x squared plus u of x, all operating on psi. So this is, um, uh, the reason I decided to, the reason I'm writing it like this is to expose you to the idea of an operator. An operator is something that operates on psi. So you have this operator and it hits the wave function. And when it hits the wave function, it does two things. First, it takes its second derivative in space, multiplies by minus h bar squared plus 2m uh, over 2m. And second, it also multiplies u by psi. Okay. Um, I will come back to this idea of an operator. I just wanted to give you the first exposure to this concept. Uh, okay. But if, if it bothers you what I said, if you don't understand what it means to write out like that, then don't worry and just focus on the first line. This is a differential equation. Uh, yesterday, I noted that there is this U present here, which is potential energy. And potential energy encodes interaction. So for example, uh, if this Schrodinger's equation describes an electron moving in between the parallel plate capacitor, right? Uh, electron experiences a force from one plate to the other, but you can also express uh, that interaction of the electron with the plates, not by means of a force, but by means of a potential energy, right? So for example, potential energy, electric potential energy of an electron in between the two capacitor plates is a linear function of the distance between the plates. If an electron is under the influence of some kind of a heavy nucleus, heavy so that you can think of it as stationary. It's experiencing uh, Coulomb force, uh, but at, at the level of the Schrodinger's equation, we don't, we don't deal with a force, we deal with the uh, Coulomb potential energy. If an electron is attached to a spring, which is attached to a wall, it sounds very artificial, but uh, we will see in what circumstances that uh, we can think of of that scenario, then the, instead of dealing with a Hooke's force, we will deal with the quadratic potential energy, right? So in other words, the interaction of the electron with something else is encoded not by means of a force of that something else on the electron, but by means of a potential energy of that electron. Or more accurately, the, the, the interaction potential energy of the electron with that something else that's, uh, that's, uh, that's interacting with it. <clears throat> okay, so we had a, a little lecture on how to read potential energy graphs yesterday. Yesterday, uh, We discussed equilibrium points, we discussed turning points, we discussed kinetic energy budget, we discussed classically forbidden regions, we discussed very important idea, very important idea that force is minus the derivative of potential energy with respect to space and where that slope of the potential energy, the derivative, is the steepest or steeper, that's where the force is larger, and where the force is, and I'm sorry, and where the slope is a more gradual, that's where the force is smaller, right? So the acceleration is smaller. So there's a wealth of information about uh, the system that you can glean from potential energies. There's also an additional intuitive uh, uh, gain from looking at potential energies is that uh, you can imagine that what a particle does is uh, what a particle would do if, if that potential energy was like a, a, a geographic landscape, potential energy landscape, right? So if you're sledding in that kind of a potential energy landscape, if I give you a potential energy landscape that looks like this, right? And I place you here, what would you do? You would accelerate, 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 and then very quickly decelerate, come to a stop, and quickly accelerate, 
and then slowly decelerate and you would do that, right? That's what you would do. So you imagine that this is like your uh, grab, like, like the height and this is like your position. But you have to remember that really the potential energy describes uh, the motion of a particle in one dimension. So what the particle actually does is it, is it accelerates, decelerates, accelerates, decelerates, accelerates, decelerates. So the motion of the particle is really in one dimension. So be careful with this gravitational analogy, but it's, it's kind of a life hack. It's a trick for you to look at the potential energy graph and say, oh, I, I see what the particle is doing. That's what, that's the motion, the horizontal motion of the particle is a, would be some, would be kind of like the horizontal motion of a sled in this kind of a landscape. Okay, so I also talked about that. And uh, okay, so why, why did we talk about that? Well, because potential energy appears in the Schrodinger's equation. I also emphasize that, well, first you kind of need to uh, understand what a classical particle would do in this kind of a potential energy landscape uh, or when a particle is uh, described by this potential energy function, and then uh, start the quantum mechanical problem. Okay, so one other thing that I wanted to mention as far as potential energies are concerned is two different kinds of motion that can happen. Okay, let's go back to the classical world. Okay, so in classical mechanics, a one dimensional time independent potential energy can give rise to two rather different kinds of motion. If potential energy rises higher than the particle's energy, particle's total energy on either side, then the particle is stuck in a potential energy well, right? So you can have a situation like this. And so this is the particle's energy. Uh, so let me say two, two types of scenarios. This is the first one. It's a little bit too close. So you can have scenario number one in which the potential energy, uh, it doesn't have to be a quadratic, right? I'm just gonna draw something like that. Um, rises higher than the total energy yeah, okay so this is some kind of an x coordinate this is some kind of a energy coordinate so this is u of x right and so you can have a scenario in which the potential energy rises higher than the energy on both sides of the motion and then what kind of motion would would this be correct this would be an oscillatory motion because you have two turning points, right? So you have two turning points. And the particle cannot go past those turning points in classical physics. So the particle is stuck in a potential energy well. We call this a potential energy well, right? The particle is stuck in this pit. It rocks back and forth between the two points, but it cannot escape without an additional source of energy, right? So I can come in and I can give it a boost of energy, then the total energy rises and the particle can rock between further points. So this is uh, called a bound state, okay? Particle is bound. So this is called a bound, bound state. Particle is bound to exist or to move in between these two turning points, okay? It cannot escape outside. This is a classically forbidden region. On the other hand, you can have a second scenario in which uh, potential energy, uh, I'm sorry, in which the energy exceeds potential energy on one or both sides. And then the part, and then, right, so let me first draw that. So you can have this kind of a situation. Right, so you can have something like this. Let's say that this is a horizontal asymptote. And let's say you have energy, the total energy is this. So, 
look like this, not pretty. I want to make a pretty graph, right? So this is your, uh, this is your total energy, right? And so now you can see there's only one turning point. So a particle cannot go here, right? So again, the particle is really moving only on the x-axis. Particle cannot um, go past this turning point So here you have two, two turn, turning points, but here you have only one turning point, okay? So if you have this scenario, then here's a possible motion. Particle comes in from infinity, okay? It exhausts its potential energy here at the turning point. Um, so first it speeds up under the influence of, of this conservative force, and then it uh, slows down stops at the turning point, immediately returns because at this point there's a force pushing it to the right. It will speed up and then slow down, but then it will, it will continue to have some amount of kinetic energy left. Remember, this is a kinetic energy budget. So the particle comes in, stops, and moves back. Okay. It comes in, stops, and moves back. So it's and never comes back again. Uh, this kind of scenario, uh, this is called scattering state. And maybe in classical mechanics, we would not call it a state, we would call it scattering motion versus bound motion. Uh, when we apply it to quantum physics, this is called a scattering state. The, partic the particle is scattered by the interaction with the force from for example, from another particle, but it does not become bound to it, okay? So most potential energies go to a constant value at infinity. So for example, here, it reaches a constant value, right? So you can say that this is U at infinity right here, this asymptote, it asymptotes to a constant value at infinity. And this is usually defined as a zero potential energy. It's a convenient reference point. Right? So in this kind of situation, uh, it's very common to add a constant so that this potential energy uh, goes to zero exactly at infinity. Remember we discussed, you can always shift the potential energy. And in this case, a good shift would be such that it basically goes to zero at infinity, right? So this is zero, okay? And then, uh, the graph, this graph that I just drew would, would be something like maybe like this, right? Um, okay. Remember, when you add a constant to potential energy, you have to add the same constant to the total energy. So most potential energies uh, go to a constant value at infinity. For example, the Coulombic potential energy goes to a constant value because at infinity, there is no force. And remember, force is the slope of the potential energy. So the, at infinity, the potential energy reaches a zero slope. It kind of saturates to some constant value. And that, that constant value is usually defined as zero. So the distinction, in that case, the distinction between a bound state and a scattering state amounts to whether E is bigger than zero or less than zero. Right. As long as you set the reference point to be at infinity, the place where the potential energy asymptotes to zero, then the distinction of whether we have a bound state or a scattering state amounts to whether E is above the x-axis or below the x-axis, right? So you can see that this is, so this is a, right here, this is a scattering state. and this is bound state. And if I ask you, why is E2 a bound state? You will tell me without hesitation that there are two turning points here. If I ask you, why is E1 a scattering state? You will tell me without any hesitation that there is only one turning point. You might ask me, well, can you have a scenario like this? Can you have a scenario like this? Uh, 
and you have some, what this potential energy uh, does is the following. It slows the particle down and then it speeds it up. So if it has large enough kinetic energy to begin with, if, it, if its kinetic energy at infinity is large enough, it will slow down but will not stop and then it will pass through. So this is kind of, um, uh, it's like a bottleneck, right? However, if its energy mm, is like that, uh, then it will have a scattering situation, right? It will come here, it will stop, and then it will scatter back. You can also have uh, a scenario that looks like this, right? In this case, instead of trying to, uh, trying to slow the particle down, this is a slingshot. It tries to speed the particle up. Right, so again, if your energy, if energy is like that, well, you have some kinetic energy to begin with, right? So you have some kinetic energy to begin with. And when the particle approaches this well, this local well, it will speed up because the kinetic energy will be larger and then it will slow down. So it will be some, some kind of a scenario like that. Uh, but in this case, in this case, you can see what happens is, if the energy is given by this value, now this becomes a trap, uh, right? So in this situation, if the energy is given by this value, now you have two turning points and the particle will just shuttle between the two turning points, okay? So you have to be careful. You can't take uh, these things as, as a general rule, but you just have to judge. All you have to look at is you have to look at how many turning points you have. In the first, in, in, in this example with a hump, well, if the energy is large enough, you don't have any turning points, but you can see that the kinetic energy will be lowest at the bottleneck. And if your kinetic energy, if your total energy is less than, um, than a certain value, then you will have uh, uh, two turning points. But what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, here the particle is approaching and it reaches a turning point and it bounces back or if the particle is approaching from, from the left, it reaches the turning point and it bounces back. You see, so you have to be very careful and you have to think about what this situation means. So even though this looks like two turning points, uh, this is really one turning point on each side, right? The particle is approaching, it hits the turning point and it bounces back and never comes back. Or the particle is approaching from the, from the left, it hits the turning point, bounces back and never comes back. Uh, in this scenario, again, if energy is sufficiently large, you have enough of a kinetic energy budget. Well, sorry, if energy is sufficiently large, yeah, you have enough of a kinetic en energy budget to, to not get stuck here. But if energy is, is below uh, this value, in this case, you have two turning points and the particle will bounce back and forth, okay? Folks, please understand, what you need to do is you need to think about how many turning points you have and what kind of a motion does a particular situation correspond to, okay? So you can't just like blindly apply rules here. You have to visualize the motion. That's how you um, think about these problems.